Hi, welcome to another episode of the Sports 2000 podcast. I'm Sue Stockdale, your host for this series that takes you behind the scenes of this British sports car prototype series. Today I'm talking to John Eiley, a new competitor in the Giro Tech category of the Sports 2000. John has always been hooked on motor racing after taking a trip to Silverstone when he was three years old. 47 years later, he gained his Ards racing licence at 50 years old and made his debut in Sports 2000 this season with the UW TSD team. Although he's only recently become a racing driver, he has been involved in motorsport on the technical side, working for a large part of his career in F1 and latterly had senior roles in Renault, Ferrari and McLaren. John now runs his own business, helping people's performance vehicles go faster. And that even includes some of those Winter Olympic sports. He is Professor of Practice at University of Wales, Trinity St. David. So there's going to be lots to talk about. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Now, did I call you a newbie to Sports 2000? Because I think this is your maiden season with Sports 2000. Would that be correct? Yes. And newbie is a very accurate description, I would say, because I think I've only got 10 races in my entire career before Sports 2000. So a very steep learning curve at the moment. So in terms of your reflections this year of, of first time being in a Sports 2000, is it a Durotech that you drive? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. So it's the latest class, but I think it's fair to say possibly not the youngest car in terms of Durotech. So it's chassis 5 which isn't as old as i think john owen's car but certainly not a spring chicken and if i had been there on the sidelines watching this year what's the number that we would have seen on the side of your car number 44 and it's not any kind of lewis tribute it's because my lucky number is eight and eight and 88 were already taken so i i had to do the four plus four routine equals eight in order to run 44 (laughs) <laughs> I'm glad there's some logic behind that that number, uh, John. So what are your reflections then of your experience? It's been a fascinating process just trying to acclimatise to sports too. My very brief experience before that was in something with a roof and enclosed. So just being outside and buffeted and hit by things. And it's a very much more intense experience, I would say, and also a lot quicker than anything I've driven before. So just getting used to that has been uh, interesting, let's put it that way. In terms of wanting then to drive a Sports 2000, what got you interested in it in the first place? Well, I think it's a very good category in terms of performance pound of currency, if you like. So it's a huge amount of speed for budget is one thing. And then I think it's fair to say my involvement with Tim Tudor and the University of Wales Trinity St. David's was definitely a strong factor in making me get involved with the students and the university and being involved in sports too through that. Now we'll come on to find out a little bit more about that relationship and what you do there with the students as our conversation proceeds, John. First, I want to pick up on the word you use there about performance. And I sense that you are very familiar with the world of performance and in particular aerodynamics within motorsport. Is that right? Yeah, so it's fair to say I'm a frustrated racing driver. It was always the plan to do this as my career from the age of three to about 16. But some careers advice at school suggested that I might need a backup plan of some kind just in case the racing driving didn't work out. And I was duly taken aback at that point, as if the racing driving was in any shape or form not going to happen. So I did some background work, I suppose, or, or studies on the technical side. And that did work out. If you say the addiction started at three, I've taken sort of 48 years to get round to finally sitting in a car. And I hope I haven't left it too late, but I'm trying to catch up some very experienced people on the Sports 2000 grid, but I've got a lot of learning to do. Well, they always say it's never too late to learn. So it's about maybe accelerating that learning as you're going around the circuits. Well, I certainly hope that's true, but I think it still remains to be proven completely, but uh, we'll see how I get on. And in that technical career then that you had, John, I understand your area of specialism was really about aerodynamics. Yes. Again, when I was studying that 
clearly at the time, particularly in motorsport, I've always been hooked on motorsport, but it became very obvious early that that was perhaps the biggest area of influence you could on race car performance. So being a bit of a performance orientated person, that made me gravitate strongly towards it. And no matter what the category has been over time and who I've worked for, it's always been aero at the core of trying to improve a particular car or a particular team's performance up the grid. And just how much is the success of any race car down to the aerodynamics compared to, say, the other technical aspects and even the driver capability? It depends a lot on the category and also the set of regulations in place at that moment. But certainly in the last 15 to 20 years in Formula One, aerodynamics has probably been the best area to spend your time and budget in terms of influencing the car. And although they may be making some changes in that general area very soon for 2022, the car performance has strongly outweighed driver influence in terms of uh, lap time. So the teams obviously spend a lot of time and money in doing all they can to improve the car performance and aero's been a a key part of that. I also know that you have not only worked with motorsport in terms of aerodynamics and helping them to improve performance, also other types of teams, in particular Olympic teams. Yeah, I think we're very fortunate in the UK to have such a strong motorsport core that when there are Olympic programs, either winter or summer, that expertise can also get tapped into in the national interests. And also through the facilities you have, either wind tunnels or computational fluid dynamics, you can certainly assist national teams to try and improve. And in particular, British cycling has been one of the key areas where British Formula One has helped but also things like uh, Winter Olympics, notably Skeleton and Lizzie Yarnold for her Olympic development as well. Certainly one of my interests is, is athletics and even the clothing and the shoes and the construction of the sports domes have all got interest around aerodynamics as well, haven't they? Yes, absolutely. So clothing in many of the categories is absolutely a key area. And there's obviously been a lot of debate about use of carbon fibre and some of that technology around sports shoes and uh, record attempts recently. But it's a whole area of sports technology and science that's obviously very interesting if you're an elite athlete and want to go quicker. So with all of this knowledge that I imagine you have in your mind, John, about aerodynamics, do you go around in general life looking for those opportunities where things aren't in flow or could be more efficient? Do you kind of apply it to all the things that you're interacting with? Yes, I'm afraid so. It's a blessing and a curse, but it's not always high up on people's agendas. I would love aerodynamics to contribute more to some of the challenges we face, certainly in terms of emissions and CO2 and those kind of things. But people tend to focus very much on what comes out of an exhaust pipe and the powertrain rather than the whole picture for trying to improve those kind of areas. But I know the aerodynamics community would like to contribute far more if possible in the future to some of the challenges we face. That brings us nicely on to your connection with the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, where you have got an opportunity to help students, I understand, think about these issues and even put some of their ideas into practice or prototype. Am I correct in that? Yes. It's one of the things this season, which is great. Tim Tudor, my teammate, is a a lecturer at the university and I do some lecturing and mentoring as well. So when we go racing in sports too, we're at trackside and effectively doing teaching and learning real time at the track, which I think is a fantastic way to help the students learn and gives them the real motorsport experience. But we're also able to take that back into the workshop and the classroom so they can learn and progress and try things. And this season has been particularly interesting for us because a project we had probably three years ago now to develop a new shape for Sports 2 has run in prototype form with Dave Houghton and car number eight for MCR. And we look forward to that program, which was 100% student developed and based, make progress in the Sports 2 arena on more cars in the future. So that must be really satisfying for the students to see the results of their efforts 
in a competition on a race. Absolutely. And for me, it's not just a perfect CV for the students doing that kind of work, but also for the university to show they're developing future motorsport engineers who can do it for real. So I think it's a perfect exhibition of what they can do. And what else does your work within the university involve then? You said you're doing some teaching there as well. What do you share with the students? A lot of my background experience and also as we go along on our different projects, you can possibly ask them some leading questions as to why a certain direction might be a good idea or not such a good idea. But I think it's such a practically and execution-based course that you get the opportunity to try things and change things and is it better is it worse is it the same and you learn so much from that whole process of iteration and what seems to be good and well can we do more of that and develop in that direction given that when you were young as you said earlier john and you had a passion for motorsport and driving and then were directed more into the technical side of things i'm just wondering whether any of those students that you teach do you sense that any of them would actually then want to get in the driver's seat in future and be driving a Sports 2000, for example? Yes, I think from my experience competing against them on our Sports 2 sim racing program that we've been doing, I think, dare I say it, some of them are probably eminently more suitable than I am to be sat in the car. But I think that probably presents a few challenges from the university point of view in terms of what the students can and can't do. But I'm also acutely aware in terms of other programs they do outside of sports too, in terms of sidecar racing and motorbike racing, that the students are definitely very involved in terms of not just the preparation, but competing as well. So there's an opportunity, I think, there for them to exercise whatever skills they have in the right areas. So maybe in one future grid in some time to come, you might have one of your students alongside you in a Sports 2000. I certainly think that's a possibility and something the rest of the Sports 2000 grid may need to be quite uh, careful and and aware of, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Now, you mentioned earlier, John, that you've only done 10 races prior to driving a Sports 2000. From coming with little experience of driving a race car, how did you tackle the challenge of then showing up and competing in Sports 2000? I think it's actually incredibly frustrating because having worked with some of the really top people on the driving side through being in F, I'm probably more acutely aware than most what is required. The frustrating thing for me trying to drive for the first time, and I wish I'd done it the other way around because I, I would have had a much better appreciation for what's important and what's involved from the driving seat. But It's so frustrating to almost know exactly what I should be doing from a driving point of view, but actually putting that into practice is a completely (laughs) different thing. So I have the awareness. It's just seat time and practice to actually make sure I can do it myself. And that's where I just need a few more races to, to try and get my head around it, really. So will you be doing secret sim training in the winter? when you can't get in the circuit? I wouldn't call it secret sim training. I'd say publicly, as this is, I'll be working hard in the sim. The sim is good, but it doesn't translate into proper seat time on the track. And if the Sneston weekend we just went through is anything to go by where we had almost every climatic condition and every tyre type not necessarily correct at the same time, I think that's a good example of there's nothing that beats experience when you're out there and I think it's even safe to say the safety car on the uh, first green flag lap actually found a few issues down at turn four and took a little while to rejoin the circuit so yeah I think it's always good to learn by doing rather than trying to get close to it with a sim. One would imagine then you're eager for next year to get back on track and get that seat time? Yes, certainly. We might be able to do something over the winter in terms of a little bit of track training ourselves, but fundamentally it's just more track time and more experience. And the frustrating thing for me is I improve every time I get in the car. But um, like Sneston at the weekend, I've never driven at Sneston before. The sim can take you so far, but actually going around the track for the first time for real, that there's no replacement for that really so at least now after a first season I should have been to most places before 
But if Thruxton gets added, that'll be another new one that I have to learn from scratch. So we'll see how I get on. (laughs) So with your performance mindset, with your experience of operating in that environment for many years of your career, are you giving the same attention to yourself in terms of preparation for these races? I'm wondering, do you have a pre-race breakfast that you eat or a particular set of routines that you go through to make sure you're right in the mindset when you turn up at the track? I have to be quite careful how I answer this because some of the students may shoot me down in flames, but I'm certainly getting lighter. So that's something I'm working on because it's a key performance parameter for me, both in terms of driver weight and car weight. So I am improving my physical conditioning on that. Diet over a race weekend can be a bit challenging. You mentioned breakfast. I would say some of the trackside cafes do do bananas and fresh fruit, but they also do other things that are less suitable for a professionally correct driver. But I try and keep on the bananas and not on the other things. But we do, as a community of students on a slightly more serious note, do quite a lot of preparation around not just the car, but what we think we should do car-wise during the weekend on both of the cars. We have a routine of sitting with the students between test sessions and between races to discuss what went well, what didn't go so well, and strategies to change that. And then typically we circulate reports and performance measures after a race weekend for us to assess actually how it went and what we should do better and differently for next time. So that's also part of the student and program learning that we're trying to do. You're really integrating the continuous improvement philosophy into every aspect of the race experience, from your own personal preparation to working with the students to the car improvement and even your knowledge of circuits and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Because while it would be nice to be doing it from a purely enthusiast and entertainment point of view, because of the background and because it's a learning process and it's students, you need to practice what you preach. So if I explain how important it is to make the car a couple of kilos lighter and I turn up a couple of kilos heavier, that's not really on message. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So you've got people helping to hold you to account for how you show up, which sounds brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. If budget was no issue and you could drive any race car you wanted, John, what would be your dream car to drive? Hmm. That's a very difficult question. And I'm not just saying this because it's a Sports 2 podcast, but I think the level we're operating at and the community around Sports 2 makes it a perfect platform for the kind of program we're trying to put together. So I think we can learn a huge amount as a group, myself driving included, and it's the right point. I come at it very much as a purist and an enthusiast, so I I love my racing. And I think, although you mentioned budgets, one of the challenges you have is as budgets get so much bigger, you tend to get other things around it, such as egos and politics and some other things, which, in my view, can detract from the enjoyment of the racing and the sport itself. So I think Sports 2 is in a very good place in terms of what we're doing as a community and some of the camaraderie and some of the students are helping our competitors on the grid. So I think that's a really nice aspect. It's good experience for them, but also shows generally as a group, we're all looking out for each other and trying to support us going forward. So that's great. Yeah, a number of the other guests we've had on the podcast have mentioned consistently this sense of community and camaraderie that there is in the paddock amongst fellow competitors. So it's interesting you mentioned that as well, John. I think you only have to look at the continuity and longevity of a lot of the competitors. And one of the surprises for me was, should we say, some of the younger competitors at the very front of the grid, I imagined as a, a newbie had probably done lots of other categories and other things and just happened to come to sports too recently. But I was very heartened to understand, and I think it's a credit to the category, that no, no, they started more or less in sports too in Pinto and then graduated to Duratech and are right at the sharp end winning races and championship having stayed. And I think that's kind of a, a lovely testimony to what Sports 2 is doing right. Yeah, absolutely. My final question to you, John, is if you could 
go back and give your 16 year old self advice, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to yourself? I think I should have done some driving earlier on. I should have maintain that enthusiasm to try and drive earlier because it's very difficult to try and pick it up all these years later. But I was so fortunate to spend a long time in all sorts of categories, including F1. And I don't think you can do that without committing 100% to it. So it's difficult. I don't think you can do both. I would have loved to have done both. But it's all these years later, it was actually an F1 colleague who said, come on, John, you've always wanted to do it. You must get in a race car. And doing your odds for your 50th birthday was a bit late. But like you said, hopefully it's never too late. And I'm keen to prove that in the coming seasons. Fantastic. Well, I'll surely be looking out for number 44, whizzing by at the next race that I come along and support. It's been lovely to speak to you today, John, and I wish you well in your continuing endeavours to improve your performance in this category. Thanks very much. And I hope we can continue to improve as a whole team with the students' help as well. Fantastic. Thank you, John. I hope you enjoyed hearing from John Eiley and we wish him well next season as he continues to learn how to drive a Eurotech quickly. Remember, you can get more details about the Sports 2000 Championship and all the drivers who compete in it at the Sports 2000 website. That's on sports2000.co.uk. And if you hop on over there, you can also listen to other episodes featuring other drivers from the grid. Do also take a moment to leave us a review, which you can do with just one click from the podcast page of the Sports 2000 website. In the next episode, we will have a roundup of the year's action and look ahead to what's coming up on the podcast in 2022. I hope you can join me then.